What might the glove, given sentience from above, think of its yearly unshelfing? What might it say of its wearing, if so in a mouth? Wool, polyester, leather plays, fingers, wrists, and snow days. Hey, don't pull me up and throw me into a box. What do you think I am? A measly pair of socks? <laughs> <laughs> I really liked that. Thanks. Thank you, Ed. You're welcome. <laughs> welcome back to Solar Scene, everybody. Sorry. I'll take your I'm line. I'm just so taken by it. <laughs> um, <laughs> today we are going to be doing the ABCs of the fashion industry. Not today, but in the Solar Scene. So talking about words that perhaps have come to shape the new, sustainable, beautiful future of fashion, perhaps some of the history, and according to you, some new words that might... Well, yeah, I, when, I, when we came up with the concept of the episode, we said we'll do an alphabet, we'll each do 13 letters, but we won't tell each other which 13 we're doing, <laughs> and we're just going to hope that we cover all 26 bases, which now I'm realizing is, is very, very... Fanciful. Unlikely. Like it's, it's very unlikely, so we'll probably have some duplicate letters, and we might miss out on poor old Q, who always seems to get the short end of the stick, unless Aaron created a fun noun involving the word Q, but actually, I didn't create any words. So. <laughs> okay. okay, and we also decided to use the format of the game called The Game, the game yeah. wherein <laughs> you each have a deck of cards in your hand, just kind of random numbers. And you have to put them down in order, but you can't communicate. And we don't actually have like one through ten. It's just like ten random numbers between one and a hundred. Anyway. If you know, you know. But basically it's you <laughs> and I think it's you can play it with as many people as you want. Yeah. And you're all supposed to like put your palms on the table and get into this subconscious like sink. This field of of shared timing, basically. The field you, that you and I live in. Yeah, the field we live in. So hopefully on this episode. Like if I have an A and you have a B, like I will go first and then, mm -hmm. and also if we get it wrong, if we ever mess up and put like a K before a Q, then we have to start again, start, yeah. the, start the recording again, let's say. Yeah. So, so like 40 <laughs> minutes in, we're just, we're toast. Yeah. Just a bit of a primer on that poem. It was a bit silly. I liked the idea of leaving the question kind of open, leaving it unanswered. What would a glove say if it was sentient? Because <laughs> I always, I don't know, I like thought experiments like that or just that kind of like vague, I guess, like Shinto philosophy of objects having souls, in this case, garments or Toy Story, mm. even. I once had a substitute teacher in middle school who was this very, very old Indian man who everybody loves. And one time it was like grade eight, so like tempers were flaring all the time. And this guy walked into class, it wasn't me, it was somebody else. And he like kicked a backpack that was on oh. the floor really angrily. And the teacher, Mr. Zembi, went on this like, 20 minute lecture in the softest tone imaginable about like what did the backpack do to you you know like don't take it out and the kid was almost brought to tears at least i was observing mm. so that's kind of what i'm trying to it's get across formative. because while i like the idea of clothes as tools like we use them you use the umbrella you don't really care about it getting wet that's what it's for you use the shoes you know we don't wear plastic bags over our shoes when we're like stepping in puddles because that kind of defeats the whole purpose also i think there should be a gratitude like it doesn't mean you have to be careless with them you can be kind mm. of like thank you mr sock or glove i was also reminded of the fact that my family home we had a whole cupboard full of gloves mm. like it doesn't sound that impressive but it was like you opened it and gloves just <laughs> poured out it was like the tupperware shelf that i guess most kitchens have yeah it was like that but with just with gloves so yeah. every time it was just like i don't know glove roulette about who would open it and Receive the wrath of the, the gloves. It's very Canadian. Also like Pinocchio, you know, the idea of like the, the maker of something giving it so much love that eventually mm. it just grows a mouth and starts talking. I think that's, that's a cute yeah. idea. Yeah, I really like the idea of in the solar scene, the production of anything. It could be food, garments, electronics even, only being made with love. Sometimes even the episodes of the podcast, it's like you don't want to go into it with a bad attitude, even if you can like present and like still make a good product, or even if you're sewing and you can still make a good product in a bad mood. Yeah. It's like you want to put good energy into it. Yeah, of course. And then I think it'll be reciprocated. Like hopefully now's the time to plug our clothing line. But like I made a point to only sew when in a good mood and if I'd get frustrated, which 
historically sewing makes me very frustrated, I would just turn it off. Whereas um, in the past, I'd probably just push on and like do it. Yeah. And I know a brand that I talk about a lot on here, Yay for Earth. She, the owner of it, Stevie, she often talks about how she will only produce if she's in a good mood. And it's like, obviously, it's not going to make the skincare product work better or anything. But it's even just on her end, knowing that the business isn't like harming her. And in the fashion... It it, it can make it better. Yeah. I'm thinking about like the Fry Cook Games, Mm. where Spongebob only made one burger compared to Neptune's like a thousand. Yeah. But he literally read a bedtime story and like tucked the little ketchup guys in with the cheese. Yeah. And I think just like the way that things are produced today, because they're made so haphazardly in such poor working conditions, under intimidation and violence and all the other stuff that we'll get into over the semester of the clothing industry in particular, it means when you buy it, you don't even want to know where it came from because Mm -hmm. then you're going to kind of feel bad about owning it. Yeah. So we want it to all be nice to hear about. Okay, so before we get into the alphabet, I did have two kind of disclaimers or two points or thoughts, I guess. One of them is an idea for a question, maybe for next week or maybe for another semester, I don't know, or just something for the listeners to to dwell on as I work. And it is how our vocabulary of art has been altered in the last two decades by pop culture Mm -hmm. and the internet. Today, obviously, is all about words, 26 words. Um, but I was thinking about like in fashion and in other, in other forms of arts, music, film, paintings, so people so often say the descriptor is like, it's X meets Y. Yeah. You know, it's SpongeBob meets Simpsons. Yeah, it's very like referential. That. There was this meme that I saw. I should have written it down as a, as a belated meme of the week. <laughs> but it was like if Tolkien of Lord of the Rings was trying to publish today. And it was a joke about how like, the publishers would be describing it in these really buzzwordy like book talk terms yeah. and they would might reject him because he didn't have enough of like a social media presence and all this kind of stuff so yeah just just something to think about and the second point which is really my first entry into the dictionary because numbers always come before letters right alphabetically yeah. so it is 65 million okay and this is the tons of plastic that won't be produced each year in the solar scene to create clothing i love that yeah, in our nature zine, shout out to the nature zine by through the link in the description, we featured a lot of these anti statistics, which is like mm-hmm. in the solar scene, there won't be this much <laughs> pollution, this much plastic used for new clothing every year. That was as of twenty sixteen, so it might be more now, it might be less, but Yeah, it's probably more. Yeah. Yeah, despite what we want to think, things are really just getting worse in terms of like the us creating pollution. Like there is more capacity to absorb pollution and counteract it, but it's not it's not enough. I guess the disclaimer, we're both sick today. We are both sick today. Or should we say l'episode du malade? So this is kind of hopefully like Michael Jordan had a famous flu game mm. where he played the game with the flu but won and like scored a bunch of points and then had to be pretty much carried off the court. <laughs> that'll be us. So that'll be us. Yeah. There's no one to carry us off except for a resident fly. <laughs> who I think makes a lot of appearance in our videos. You okay, only have one okay. fly. Let's plug in. Let's plug in. Accessories. <laughs> that was a safe bet. Yeah. Okay. Accessories. Also a disclaimer. <laughs> a lot of mine are really heavy. Okay. So like if you're not in a heavy mood, maybe just listen later. But this one is light. So accessories are an item that contributes to an outfit in a secondary manner. So a primary garment that isn't an accessory, just like a piece of clothing, would be something that would cover you. But then an accessory is a hat, a pair of earrings, belt. Everyone knows what accessories are. Socks? I was thinking a bit about, because there's kind of some middle ground of like, even a hat could perhaps be a primary garment. But I think if it isn't practical, so like socks are practical. Okay. And thermal layers are practical they're not really accessories but i think accessories are a bit more they have no real use even a belt perhaps could be considered mm. a primary article for some outfits but not all of them yeah what is your favorite accessory i like scarves but not like winter scarves i like silk scarves for like hair and your neck 
I really, really want to wear more like neck scarves. I feel like they're very posh and cute. <laughs> What's your favorite accessory? I think I am anti-accessory. I you really, are. I mean, I do wear socks sometimes, not around <laughs> the house. Maybe I like in cartoons when like the Peter Pan or Robin Hood character will have one of those forest hats oh. with a feather in it. Mm. If it has a feather in it, it's probably an accessory, right? Yeah. So I'll go for feather. Unless you're an owl, in which case it's a primary garment. <laughs> oh so it's all yeah. relative. It's true. <laughs> okay. Biodegradable. No. I had an A. I didn't know that you were switching. I didn't okay, know that sorry, you were moving sorry. on. So we need to say like next. Yeah, next. Okay. Um, almanac. That's okay. my A. Okay. And this was something of an invention, but spinning off of something that exists. When you hear almanac, what's the word that precedes it that you think of? Farmers. Farmers almanac. Did you ever have one of those? I don't think so. Do you know they are? They're kind of like a prediction for the weather. For It has the moon cycle in yeah. it. All of these different types of things. And it's good to predict the first frost. Right. The last. The crop. Yeah. I thought that was... Well, it's tough. just like... The Farmer's Almanac, which comes out every year, it just seems like this really funny and kitschy relic. Yeah. Wherein it's like, it's always in grocery stores. <laughs> but if you're in a grocery store, you probably don't live on a farm. Like you probably <laughs> don't need one. Um, so it seems like it's a relic from from simpler, maybe more solo times, I don't know. But also it just seems like it has this weird kind of almost supernatural existence where no one knows where it comes from it's true. It's like, what did the farmers all get together and write this <laughs> do they do the farmers publish it is it government thing so that's so bizarre so i like the idea of an almanac being just this thing that's in every everybody's house mm. everybody has like a dictionary everybody has a fashion almanac or a clothing or a textile like almanac maybe it could be called okay which is some kind of encyclopedic resource for maybe identifying different weaves or or materials or maybe how to do basic repairs mm. or it could be the seasonal thing of like or maybe just the the trend thing like that i guess that would be the one-to-one -one comparison with the farmer's almanac like yeah. okay so instead of it saying this year rainfall is going to be this they say okay this year green is really going to be in or something like that i don't know but but maybe maybe it wouldn't be annual maybe it would just be every decade or something like that i also think it's useful because when you make your own clothes it takes a lot of time so like Avid knitters and things start their winter sweaters in the summer. Because okay. if you start your winter sweater, like start knitting it in the winter, yeah. it's too late. So the almanac could kind of be like, okay, July 14th, start your sweater. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. And like things the like calendar. that. Perhaps, oh, because this is when this crop is harvested, it takes this long to spin right. and then you can buy the... Yeah, don't wear white after Labor Day. Yeah. Because that's such a, like, that's <laughs> such a weird rule. Mm-hmm. Maybe we could talk about that next week, like the origins of that or something. Yeah. Also, what is Labor fashion Day? I don't cliches. even know what that is. I only know <laughs> Labor Day that we're not supposed to wear white after it. But yeah, fashion cliches. Yeah. We can talk about that. Because um, I was going to do instead of an almanac, like catalog. Okay. But then that kind of contradicts one of my later ones. But yeah, just the idea of some kind of book presence. Because I know people might say you can get all this online. Mm. Not the point. Yeah, this is also a good opportunity to talk about in the solo scene, my vision for just like the whole industry, which is selling patterns and still doing runways. I kind of touched on this last week, but the runways are to inspire you to look into your closet and say, oh, these are kind of trendy this year, different ways to mix things up. Because we're not going to, like in the solo scene, trend cycles aren't going to just like stop existing, yeah, but course. they'll be completely decoupled from like the buying of new clothes. And I just think that's really important because often when people talk about sustainable fashion, it's like you want things to be timeless. You want them to be... Like, you can wear them your whole life. Mm -hmm. And that's true. Like, you want the pieces to be practical and timeless in a durability sense. But you're going to be styling them in different ways, so like accessories. You'll use those to kind of change your outfits a bit. But it just won't be a whole industry. What is chicken soup for the soul? Because that also reminds me of the Farmer's Almanac. And it's just every house has it. No one ever re reads it. If it doesn't even have words in it. Or is it just a cover? <laughs> We had them. We had chicken soup for like the teens. I don't know. I think it's a part of that kind of, um, what do you call it? The American. I Is it recipes? No. Oh. It's like self-help. I think oh. it was published by like Crosswalk Publishing or one of those like kind of, kind of Christian, kind of not, kind of just like right wing I don't know. publishing so it wasn't houses. 
no, the farmers had nothing to do with it, and there's no, no soup. Because I really thought it was a recipe book as well. I was like, oh, chicken soup for the soul. It would all be these, like, homey recipes, but no. Next. <laughs> Biodegradable. So... I chose biodegradable because I always get biodegradable and compostable confused. Mm. So do you know the difference? Biodegradable means that it will break down in a reasonable time period in nature. It's the opposite. What? So I thought that as well. It's why I chose it. And then I started researching it. So that's always literally what confused. the word means if you just take it apart. But it means it will bio, like anything will biodegrade. Yeah, obviously. Plastic will in like a million years. So basically, biodegradable, the way we use it is shorthand for quickly biodegradable. Yeah. That's so but often people will trick us by putting on your coffee cup, on your plastic bags. Like they can legally put biodegradable. <laughs> okay. And so people will buy them and be like, oh, it's environmentally friendly. They maybe use it to line their compost yeah. bins. But what you need is compostable. That means within a reasonable time period. Oh, okay. I thought that meant yeah. it was like edible. Not edible, but usable for food. Mm. I guess it's the same thing. Yeah, pretty much. Like something it often is plant-based. It's not going to be synthetic really. But yeah, so just a word of warning when you're looking into perhaps garments that you're like, oh, I want to get something that can break down. I don't want to buy something polyester. Keep your eye out for a compostable versus biodegradable. And sometimes people just make the mistake, as I do often, yeah. and will mislabel it as biodegradable but you have to look into what it's made of and make sure that at the end of its life you put it into the compost because even if it's compostable and you put it in the regular garbage because um, landfills are so compact like they just dump stuff on top of stuff there's no oxygen yeah and so even something like a banana peel won't break down quickly in a landfill because it's anaerobic which means without oxygen yeah also Shout out to our municipality for giving us brown bins yesterday. That was so exciting to me. Now we can recycle compost because it was like, I don't know, walking back 30 years moving to this place in Montreal when it was just thrown in with the regular trash. Yeah. But now we're, we're moving up. Yeah. <laughs> Next. Bonfire of the Vanities. It's good? Yeah. Okay. So this term, people might have heard it because it's used sometimes like in books and movies. But originally, it was in 1497 in Florence when these religious leaders were like, we're going to burn everything that might lead us into sin. So mm. we're going to burn all the mirrors. We're going to burn all the playing cards, a lot of the musical instruments, things like that, uh, cosmetics, some clothes. And yeah, it was a thing in like the late 1400s in different parts of Italy and I think Europe. And in the solar scene, I don't want us to like start doing this again. Like I don't think we should just start burning evil clothes and stuff. But what I like about it is the idea of a kind of systematic renewal or like a purging. You know, we talk about in New Year's Eve, like different different cultures at the end of the year or in the dead of winter, they often have some kind of ritual burning of the last 12 months, mm -hmm. some kind of saying goodbye. Yeah. And so I think because we, we know that end of life in fashion is such a big problem. I'm not suggesting we burn everything. Yeah. But I'm just talking about this ethic and like keeping it keeping it in mind, kind of like Guy Fawkes, or also for some reason, even though it seems like the opposite, in my mind this also reminds me of families having those patchwork blankets. You know, mm. the ones where it's like every year, usually the mum will will sew or knit like this square of it. Yeah. Did you ever have anything like that? We didn't. Yeah. Maybe we should get one of those going. That'd be really cute. Yeah. You don't like cutesy things? No, I don't like cutesy things. No, I think that's a good idea. Something like passing the time consciously or noting mm -hmm. the time or something. And just like an annual assessment of... Spring cleaning. I like spring cleaning. Yeah, of like, are there any things leading me to sin or anything leading me to yeah. like vanity or... It's just good to reassess because you can really easily get into habits that are like self-indulgent and perhaps not best for the greater good even for your own What's the name soul of development the, of the netflix woman marie kondo marie kondo that's my m yeah i was gonna say marie kondo even earlier in this episode because she's maybe we should have the marie kondo episode but it's she talks about the soul in the items because i believe she's shinto or at least was raised in a shinto culture and she talks about like yeah thanking the item mm -hmm. and then passing it on or just like 
yeah, how does it make you feel? So we can all be a little bit more Marie. Next. Circular fashion. It's good. Good. Okay, it's clear. Designed, produced, and sold without waste and pollution. It keeps good condition during its life, and then you can dispose of it in a regenerative way, not just a neutral way. I thought it meant clothes that are round. Well, I knew you were going to say that. (laughs) It doesn't mean clothes that are round. So circular fashion is inspired by the cradle-to-cradle model, which some people may know, and also by... It's really... um, championed by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. So those are kind of two different camps that often talk about this and are really advocating for this practice to be practiced in all industries, but mainly the fashion one, because it's kind of easy to do it in the fashion one. Like with the electronic industry, it's much more challenging because the rare earth metals kind of break down over the lifespan of the the item and stuff like that. But with fashion, it's really doable and that's something that I think we should just kind of accept of like there are models that exist for the problems that we're faced with we just need to accept them and with circular fashion it's cheaper because there's less waste along the whole whole process because you have to think about when things are produced in a coal factory or like in something powered non-sustainably like you're literally just like losing heat, therefore losing energy and money. And you're also losing a bunch of materials. So like when you cut a pattern, there's always going to be scraps unless it's you're making like a box. Mm-hmm. But then reusing those scraps either by recycling them or upcycling them, which will be a word later probably. <laughs> <laughs> I just gave that away. Um, but yeah, circular fashion. I'm going to talk about that quite a lot this semester. And it also was the biggest principle behind the Solacene clothing line. Next. Custom. Okay. I think there's something subconsciously demoralizing about everybody wearing the same clothes from Zara and H&M. That's almost it. Like architecture was another word that I thought about doing for this episode because I was having a lot of like parallels between buildings and clothes and it reminds me of the way people talk about soulless modern glass buildings Mm. that's how it feels like buying clothes these days it really does Um, it's really frustrating and i think this is what leads it very clearly into the rise of thrift shopping Mm -hmm. because people are like this is a way even if it was a mass-produced thing it's from 30 years ago so no one else is going to have it Mm -hmm. and also in the solo scene, I just think the idea of having a some kind of relationship with a seamstress or a tailor is like a fun thing. Like people talk about like, oh, I have a loyalty to my barber. Mm-hmm. It's like tailor could kind of be the same thing, but maybe because everyone wears T-shirts and sweatpants now, they don't think to alter it. But I just think even if you bought the most basic like Nike T-shirt or something, if you do something to it, yeah, and having the skills to do it yourself. Yeah, or do it yourself. That's cool as well. And to customize. That was really common, like, until quite recently, probably, like, the 2000s is really when it stopped. Uh, people would, it was just standard to embroider your napkins, embroider your tea towels, um, customize things because we had the skills. But then the skills within a generation or two were lost because people didn't have the time, the yeah. resources. And because all of a sudden the options at the stores were so vast, you didn't really have to anymore. Like you really can all shop from Zara and each have a different outfit. It will look the same kind of on a macro scale, but on the micro, you can kind of all dress differently a little bit. Yeah, I also think maybe the fact that people didn't have Netflix until very recently, it was like, well, I'm just going to sew on this napkin. Because how else am I going to pass the evening? Yeah, it's very little women. Next. (laughs) Dale of Norway. Okay. I got it? Yeah. Do you know this brand or this company? No. What if I told you Quebec City? (laughs) It's the brand that made me kind of go... (gasps) Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so it's a very Nordic knitwear. It's Norwegian, yeah. Yeah. It's this Norwegian kind of knitwear store that we stumbled into in Quebec City when we went there. And... 
the clothes were just really, really, really nicely made. <laughs> they were just really nicely made. Like I they felt were... walking in there like the guy from Peanuts who just has a cloud of dirt around him. Because I was like, I probably shouldn't be in the store. Yeah. Touching everything with my grubby mitts, sneezing into all the jumpers. Um, they all have like the Norwegian style, excuse me, I don't know the name for it, but like that knit pattern, mm-hmm. or most of them do. Which is not, like it's not really about that. It was just, the reason I wrote it is the idea of aspirations. Because mm-hmm. when we were both in there, we couldn't really afford anything. Mm-hmm. But we were just like, one day. Yeah. And we also kind of, it was like this commitment as in, I'm not really going to buy any clothes until I come back here and buy one of these. Jumpers, yeah. Which obviously neither of us held ourselves to, but you know, it's always in the back of your mind. Mm-hmm. So that's what. Dale of Norway. Dale of Norway. And I also, I went on their website and found this description that they put of their company. So it says, where the deep fjords of West Coast Norway end, nicely tucked away between towering mountains, you'll find the village of Dale and the cornerstone company, Dale of Norway. Being located next to a once mighty river, this location is no coincidence. The combination of high mountains and a wet climate with plenty of rainfall enables the waterfalls with almost unlimited access to pure energy and a corresponding pure environmental conscience. Oh, wow. And I just thought it sounded like a, a passage from Lord of the Rings or something. It sounded really fun. But maybe we have this tendency to kind of exoticize Scandinavia anyway. Yeah. But yeah, just pictures of the town. And also the company was since 1879. And that's something that you should advertise. Mm-hmm. Like we said last week, if you're since 2016, maybe don't have that in the, in the logo. Yeah. But if you're since 1879, we want to know. Let us know. Next. Eco. Okay. Um, this was my Solocene word for cool that I thought of. Ooh, I like that. So eco. Yeah, it's eco. I think also because in the Solocene, sustainability will be such a kind of ingrained ethic mm-hmm. that you won't really need to describe things as eco-friendly or environmental or sustainable because it's almost a given. Mm-hmm. So you just be like eco kind of gets co-opted into other things. I like that. I know that usually words for cool are temperature related. Cool. Hot cold yeah but eco can mean like it's so like it's perfect yes yeah, eco yeah like that and also eco nico if you remember him the the hottest item of the solacine christmas solacine furby where all the kids are lining up to buy an eco nico real solacine heads will know they'll remember admittedly i forgot about eco nico until now and how <laughs> proud you were of that <laughs> invention <laughs> let me tell you about the hottest <laughs> item of the season <laughs> next farm okay i've gone a b c d e f and i just when i was brainstorming words for this episode i had like 50 and i realized six or seven of them could be summed up in farm Mm. and i was just thinking like why do we stop doing field trips why do we age out of them we shouldn't no going to the farm like that's such a fun thing and also it just even thinking about it it grounds you in the process of clothes and in the fact that a garment is a thing that comes up from the earth just like a carrot does. You know, when you, when you buy a carrot or a pepper and it still has some dirt on it, you're like, oh, this is, you know, it was from a farm. When you go to Zara, no dirt in sight. No, maybe we should, that'll be our, like, guerrilla activism. We go to Zara and kind of put a little bit of dirt on everything. <laughs> <laughs> like, like that you just get arrested. Probably. He keeps bringing in buckets of mud, <laughs> <laughs> throwing it on the clothes. Yeah. Cool. Also related to this, all through my childhood, for some reason in my living room, were just cooking shows on the television. Mm-hmm. And in many of those, it'll be following one man or woman who goes on a little tour to different places. And often they'll hit the local farms and be like, wow, love these vegetables. And they'll point to some or p- pick them themselves. I'm going to make a meal out of these or maybe point to a chicken. I'm going to use those eggs or that meat. So I just think, like, imagine going to a farm and being like, wow, look at the sheep. Mm. Yeah, there are some really, really great brands that kind of saved these breeds of sheep that during the, like, there was a big revolution of, like, sheep farming. And they were like, we don't need all of this diverse wool. We can just go with, like, the few most hardy stocks. But there were a few, like, literal just individuals who went around and went to auctions where they'd be sold for their meat and bought the sheep and they were able to breed them. And, like, they saw the sheep and they were like, this sheep is valuable. Now they have very small but still successful 
knitwear brands because they loved these sheep so much. Yeah. Also, so cool. shout out to the alpaca farm. Mm. If you know, you know. Next. Greenwashing. The solar scene is a greenwashing project. Yeah. <laughs> so greenwashing is the first word I came up with, and it's when a company gives a false impression that its products are more ethical and sustainable than they really are. So this is not going to exist in the solo scene. Greenwashing will take on a new meaning of Ooh. just like, oh, your product's a little bit unsustainable. It needs to be greenwashed. <laughs> <laughs> like it needs, to, but it means actually like cleaning it up yeah. and making it green. Sure. I like that kind of reappropriation. I don't, of know, I don't know about that one. Because <laughs> I think that was the original intent of it, probably. Probably. But then it got spun and now you're trying to spin it back. Yeah, spin it back. Trying to reclaim the slur. But anyway, greenwashing is a term that I thought was just like everyone knew because it's an appropriation. Appropriation? It's a iteration of whitewashing, which everyone I think did know. But anyway, greenwashing is often very successful. I mean, even people that I talk to just like who aren't in the sustainability space about like, oh, what do you think of H&M? They say, well, they have their conscious line. They have yeah. those like recycling bins where they recycle your clothes. And that's just like a greenwashing campaign. 96% of H&M's claims about their sustainability are proven false. And those bins where you bring your clothes to donate to be recycled end up in the garbage because people who work there have just been like, yeah, we just throw them out with the regular garbage. Like we don't recycle them. So H&M, please don't shop there. Yeah. I mean, my H was H&M, but we'll, yeah. we'll get there next. Okay. No, it wasn't. But. Okay. Next. Homeworkers. Is that it's safe? Yeah, it's safe. Homeworkers? Homeworkers. Oh. So when I say homeworkers, what do you think of? A stay-at-home mum or dad. Okay. Or you think of like work from home. Oh, yeah, yeah. Think of like there's a lot of things you think of. And I didn't know that homeworking was a part of the fashion industry. And it's like, okay, this is... So <laughs> <laughs> within the fashion industry, there's like say H&M, and then they have their factories, like the H&M factories. But because the demand is so high, they subcontract to other factories. And there, when you subcontract, you lose control. And they're audited because of all of the disasters that have taken place over the last like 200 years in garment factories. There's auditors, but they are basically based on accounts of people who used to audit and then don't anymore. They can basically see a blocked fire escape and just say, just kind of brush over it and pretend like they didn't see it because they, they need the garments to be produced cheap. So they'll cut every corner. Anyway, so there's the subcontractors, but then they, if they can't meet the, the time or the volume, they will subcontract again and it can just go down until it basically ends up at home workers who are women, often widowed or just their husbands are off working in India, Bangladesh, and a few other countries around the world, people from the companies will come to them and they do a lot of finishing work. So bead work, embroidery, sewing buttons on, all of these like highly skilled in the West. Like you need a lot of skill to do bead work, you need a lot of skill to embroider, but there is considered like the simple work basically because they're like, oh, it's just for these women to do like they they're into this or whatever. And they're like paid basically nothing, often literally nothing, but they are afraid to speak up because they need any money they can get because they're alone and like there's no other work in the industries. And it's not just women, like some towns, everyone does this. So like a big company will come in and they'll say, we need you to sew a million buttons on. Right. And everyone will do it. And it's just like pretty much the worst treated people within the garment industry it often is okay you're assigning it to the woman of the house or the man of the house then they'll get the whole family to work on it because if they don't meet the order or if any of the garments are damaged while they're in their homes they will not be paid yeah. or they'll be charged for the damage so in the solar scene there'll be a lot of home working <laughs> yeah i mean i did i just wanted to introduce this concept here um because it's like Maybe you can spin it so it means something positive again. I don't know. Maybe, yeah. Maybe. 
But I just think this is something I'll go into. I think we'll have to have like a doom and gloom episode yeah. where I just tell you about all the bad things. But sure. this is just an introduction. Yeah, it's just really terrible. And I really was shocked because like, I knew that the factories were like absolutely despicable <laughs> and terrible. But the fact that there was like an evil beyond what I could even conceptualize or even knew was just so like so shocking to me that it's like okay the factories are despicable they're making them like live on on the floor of the factory or whatever then it's just like are you kidding me someone thought of something worse <laughs> and yeah. they did they did think of something worse i'm not laughing about the concept i'm laughing about it being preceded by eco nico <laughs> <laughs> that's the thing i was like i'm gonna bring these heavy concepts and you're gonna bring all. like that's what it's about yeah okay Internal variety variety okay. variety hour next Internal cost. Cool. Which is a nice follow-up. It is. I was thinking about doing external cost, but obviously I already had eco, so couldn't double up. And this, again, is a follow-up from Dale of Norway, where it's like, oh, man, it's a nice jumper, but 400 bucks. Mm. But also, it's like, one time I went into an Old Navy outlet, famous story between you and I, and <laughs> the shorts were on sale for 28 cents. And people were just <laughs> literally buying... Just handfuls, armfuls of these quite ugly shorts. And it'll be like, these don't fit you. You're just buying them because. Because they're 28 cents. Because they're 28 cents. And, you know, it's like, it's funny, but also it's like, in what world could, I mean, they weren't, it's Old Navy, so they're not like mm. amazing, but it's still that amount of fabric and it still has a pattern on it. And it's like, how could that have how could 28 cents be the appropriate price for this? Yeah. And this has just been on my mind recently with Canada's inflation, or as we call it, the monopoly money mm -hmm. coming into coming into effect and just different sales that are always lighting up my email inbox where it's like, oh, 60% off at the gap, 40% off here, summer sale there, uh, obviously Prime Day where it's like we're slashing our prices to this much. And it's like, but this... It doesn't make sense. No. So I think, like, it's it's hard to do it without sounding too much like a like a corporate, I don't know, bootlicker or something. But prices kind of should be high. Prices kind of should be quite high because things should take time and and as you said, love and mm -hmm. love isn't cheap uh, to make. And also, it's just like you made the solo scene clothes, right? And we were mm -hmm. like having the dilemma about what should the price of these be. Yeah. So, so so to get, you know, back to the word internal cost basically means that our m most of our commodities say are almost artificially the prices are low because they don't incorporate all the various external costs. So it's like if it was all internalized along the way from from seed to hamburger, it would cost a lot more. Mm -hmm. And especially if it was made in America. Like when people talk about that, it's like well, if the iPhone was all constructed in America, it would be three thousand dollars yeah but it's like maybe it should be i don't know well yeah because you're exploiting people and the planet along the way yeah and also you're externalizing the cost of the end of life so there's places around the world where all of our tech waste is like no exaggeration dumped same with clothes it's like even when you donate it to a thrift store what happens when it doesn't sell there it's often shipped abroad and then just dumped back on the people who are suffering to make it in the first place and like there are being people are, like are literally being displaced because the dumps are getting so big and it's just like what about the cost of their literal lives like not even just like oh the cost of that land that's going to take to house this waste it's like there's just so many costs on the way and you don't think about okay this factory can produce it for one dollar like a pair of shorts for one dollar they're exploiting the people on the way that's obvious but it's also the river that they're dumping all of the dye waste into, which is then poisoning people yeah. for kilometers and kilometers. So yeah, next. we need to think about next. that. Next. <laughs> is a K. Okay. Am I good? Yeah. Uh, it's Kalai, which is the start of kaleidoscope. K-A-L-E-I. Okay. And I guess this is a word I made up. Here's the thing. I love writing, especially fiction, especially fantasy. I am terrible at coming up with fantastical names mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm always be like schmoozy and that's the name for that the main character or something 
it can be like a really great story. I just, I'm not very good. So Kalai was the name that I came up with for also old heads will know on the ecosystem episode, we talked about the smartwatch equivalent in the solar scene. Mm-hmm. And so it's kind of like kaleidoscopic because it's like, it's wonderful or wondrous or something like that. It's mostly health focused. Listen to that episode in the internet semester if you want to know more about it. But just today I wanted to mention most wearable technology is hideous. I think borderline, it's just my opinion, anti-fashion. Kind of is. Like smartwatches, etc. Yeah. But we could talk about wearable technology maybe in a future episode. Did you ever watch Ben 10? I don't think so. Well, he has a cool watch anyway. Next. <laughs> Long Johns. This is also the garment of the week. Okay. So Long Johns are long underwear or thermal layer. They're traditionally made of silk, which I didn't realize because all of my long johns have been polyester. But long johns are a name for long underwear. Yeah. Like, do you know, would you guys call them long johns when you were growing up? Me guys. Like your family? Never wore them. Oh, Never so had you're, them. you're a warm breed. We're a warm breed and also England is a warm place, warm That's place true. in Nova Scotia. But yeah, we never, I have... I don't think I have ever worn a pair of long johns. Okay. So we were basically forced. My dad was a big long johns guy. Long John Silver. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that's Who not where that? the name comes a from. Pirate? I think so. Okay. Um, but it comes from a boxer named... Johnny? John L. Sullivan. And he was famous for wearing long johns in the boxing ring. Just long johns. And they were, like, so he just wore this outfit. Yeah. So Long John's had been around for, like, two centuries before Mr. John Sullivan. But they were just kind of called, like, thermals or long underwear, as they were. They were mainly used as pajamas. But then when he came around, someone kind of looked at him and was like, wow, this is a big marketing opportunity. Was he tall? I don't know. I think he might have been. Might have been tall. And they were actually popularized and started mass production in Truro, Nova Scotia. Shout out to Nova Scotia. And that's probably why we call them Long Johns, because whereas everyone else around the world probably just calls them... I think Long Johns is, is somewhat universal. Okay, I couldn't, get, I couldn't gather from the, from the internet. But I just think they're great because they can make you your clothes go further. So like you can just wear them underneath like clothes in the winter. And make them actually workable. And then you don't have to have a huge wardrobe of like winter clothes, fall clothes, summer, spring. Right. Makes things a bit more versatile. So how are they different from tights? I just think because they are... It's a loose a weave? It's a loose... Like it's more breathable. How are they different from leggings? Again, I think more breathable. Okay. Like I don't like wearing leggings underneath clothes. It's just uncomfortable. I don't know how to describe it other than that. But when you wear long johns... Because they're often made of a breathable fabric. They're not as noticeable. But when we were kids, they were very scratchy. Very scratchy, and I hated wearing them. But now I have comfortable ones. Get yourself a pair of long johns. That's my... So I've seen long johns when? (laughs) They'll be coming soon. Next. Places. It's a bit of a cop out because I was trying to come up with an actual type of place. Mm-hmm. But again, my naming kind of sucks. So I was like, I'll just say places. And I just think in the solo scene, we'll be offering more interesting experiences. I remember when we were in a mall once in England, there was just a blank, it would have been a store, but instead it was all empty except for a ping pong table. You could just go in and play ping pong. So amazing. And it was so rare that it still sticks in my head, even though it's such an innocuous thing, because things like that they just don't really happen. So I think, I don't know, whether it's like a, a take a garment, leave a garment, that might not work like it does with books, but something like this. Maybe it's just stores trying to display things in, a, in somewhat of a different way to the absolute standard. Like mm. every clothing store is merchandises in the exact same way. I remember Yeezy Gap, I think it was Yeezy Gap, tried to do that and they just got memed online when it was like the clothes were just in bins that people could rummage through. Mm -hmm. But I think that's also one of the reasons people like thrift stores, because there are those bins, and people like to rummage. Or I like to rummage anyway. Get elbow deep in there. You never know what you're going to touch. Filthy rat. Yeah, filthy rat. There's also a bikini store that I I always thought looked cool in a mall. (laughs) 
<laughs> one time, <laughs> not because of the bikinis, but they were just like, they were all kind of floating. Yeah, they were like hanging from the ceiling. Yeah, they were hanging. Yeah, kind of cool. I used to have a walk-in closet in an old house Okay. for a few months. So places. Places. Do, have, have you ever been into a store and been like, this displays clothes really neat? I like this. Hmm. I mean, there's really only so many ways. That you yeah, can like there's do nothing it, but... that really stands out. There's things that I dislike, mm. which is when the bars are suspended from the ceiling and you're trying to look through it and it's swaying. swaying and it's like so a boat. annoying. Because like, like I think Aritzia does that, and there's a lot of thrift stores that do it, like kind of trendy thrift stores. And I'm like, maybe there's a reason there's racks, yeah. but you could do folded. Like shelves are cool when they have all the sweaters kind of folded on shelves. What about this? It's like one of those tidal pools that you can visit kids visit they go in put their hand in get hurt because they touch the puff of fish or something like mm-hmm. that jellyfish you squeeze it ink goes everywhere but it's all sand not water okay so it's like a tidal pool but made of sand mm-hmm. and they have to dig to find the clothes <laughs> okay. they're all buried interesting <laughs> maybe there's a map what about when you go to a have you ever been to a dry cleaner no i've never been they have this like moving yeah. Thing where the clothes move. They're it's like, like oh, car- you're number 24. And it's they like, a, like it's like a carnival it. game. Yeah. <laughs> you have to try and hit it with a ball. Yeah. Whichever one you hit, you have to buy. Yeah. I think that moving is cool. Or like you have like buttons you have to press to like go through them. You play Something. the crane game to try and get it. Ah, yeah. oh, I got the wrong socks. Yeah. Now I have knee highs. But yeah. I really wanted ankles. That'd be funny, actually. It would be. And then you have to trade or something. I don't know. Next. Rana Plaza. Was that Plaza? Rana Plaza. R. Okay. Okay. So I'm. I won't dwell on these because we'll talk about these in the bummer episode. But I grouped two places: <laughs> Rana Plaza and Triangle Factory, which are two kind of historic disasters in the fashion industry. Yeah. Which I think we'll probably refer to. I mean, I will at least kind of frequently because they both kickstarted um, movements. So. Triangle Factory was in 1911 and Rana Plaza was in 2013. So like 1911, this was kind of what it happened in America, um, in Manhattan. And there were hundreds of people who died, mainly women and children, because all of the fire escapes were locked. And it kind of was the start of like workers' safety standards. Before then, there was nothing. It also really kickstarted the child labor laws in the United States. But then because of all these laws, that kind of is what caused all the export of manufacturing. And I'm not saying these laws shouldn't have come into place. But because people don't care about human lives, they just were like, oh, if they're going to be strict on us here, we're going to export. And then in 2013, this happened in Bangladesh and thousands of people died, 2,500 injured, and then over a thousand people died because it was this factory that because the demand was growing so much. They just like built on top of an already like 16 floor building. They just like added floors that were not checked or anything. And they knew it was dangerous. And on the morning of the disaster, the power went out instead of just like sending people home on these top floors, they started um, generators, which were shaking the building and people were trying to get out before it even collapsed because it was like, this isn't right. But they wouldn't let them out. And then, yeah, it was just a complete disaster. And this is one of the biggest disasters in the industry, but it's not the only one. And it's just like between these two, they both kickstarted different movements of unionization and of people standing up for workers' rights. And yeah, just wanted to note them next. Just so the listeners know, we're having to cut every... 45 seconds, so that one of us can sneeze or cough. So if you see on YouTube, it looks like we're cutting it like that one scene in, in Taken where they try and make it look like Liam Neeson's hopping the fence. Uh, that's why, so that you don't have to see us <laughs> yeah. be sick. I was thinking about adding in like a cough counter on the screen. Yeah. But that seems a little bit too cruel almost. Okay, so you said next, but I, I worry that our timing has been messed up a little bit here. So it was Rona, Rana Plaza. Yeah. Next. Superhero. Okay. I was going to use this also as Halloween I was thinking about, but Halloween has a bit of a like illusionary kind of playing dress up vibe where a superhero, mm-hmm. you could technically always have that on like Clark Kent, have mm-hmm. it on underneath your suit or your suit could be your thing. And what I'm thinking about here or alluding to is just like the idea of 
empowerments. And as you know, I really like the idea of people dressing themselves up like characters, yeah. not in a cosplay way, I'm going to dress up as Clark Kent, but I'm going to be my own Clark Kent or superhero and design my costume. Mm. I know people don't like this because they think there's something artificial about it. Maybe there is. I don't know. Maybe it's not, it's not the most like psychologically integrated way of considering clothes as a kind of source of self-esteem. Maybe it should come from within. Maybe that's a question for next week. I don't know, like clothes either representing or kind of self-assured version of yourself or something. Yeah, I think that's an interesting question for next week for sure. Yeah, But like I always watch superhero movies or last night we watched Porco Rosso, my favorite Studio Ghibli movie, probably my favorite movie. And I just love the way Porco dresses. And he just seems like this larger than life character. Or um, Doctor Who is another show that we both enjoy. And it's like every inter- every iteration of that character gets their costume, which they wear the same thing every day. Steve Jobs, you know, it makes them like a thing. It makes them a yeah. cool thing. And I also think that we do this already to an extent, specifically the superhero thing, when we wear logos. Like you wear a, a Nike mm-hmm. swoosh on your chest and it makes you feel at least a little bit like the Flash. Like the flash has this all lightning thing. Yeah. That's how we feel. But that's not a good thing. Like the branding thing is not good. But I was also thinking about those fashion sketches, you know, where they do it with like highlighters. Mm. People often do it for concept art, for characters or places in a fictional world. We could do it to ourselves kind of. Yeah. I think it's kind of cool. Like this concept. Next. Sneakers. So sneakers Wait, are... Sneakers is... Before superheroes. Oh, I did, wasn't even thinking <laughs> about like the second letter. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, this is the first Sneakers. time we messed up since Almanac. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop dwelling on everything so long because okay. I feel like yeah. it's gonna be three hours. <laughs> Sneakers are general purpose shoes used to be comfortable, stylish for everyday and athletic purposes. Oh, really. I wanted to talk about sneakers in contrast to tennis shoes or running shoes, which are more specific, and also how sneakers have kind of become the shoe of the people. Yeah. And I just think it's kind of interesting because the shoe of the people used to just be like a dress shoe sort of, or like a black leather shoe. Uh-huh. But now because sneakers, I think are it's better to wear shoes that are comfortable. We're both big proponents of comfortable and practical shoes. Yeah, I don't think sneakers go far enough in yeah. those cases. Yeah, so I just think it's cool. But it's also the fact that it's like, okay, maybe there should be different shoes for different purposes. Like, don't wear sneakers to your wedding, is what I'm going to say to someone. I shouldn't um, have. You didn't, reason, fortunately. Yeah. Um, and also, don't wear sneakers if you're rock climbing. Maybe wear rock climbing shoes. Like, I think it's cool to have specialized things, but yeah, I like sneakers. Next. They make me feel like sneaking. Mm, like, you can go really quietly. Yeah, I go really quietly. For sure. Steal something. My next one is... Tennis. Okay, you skipped because I also had another S. Oh, sure. Sweatshops. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like sneaking. Let's talk about sweatshops. Yeah, okay. Um, I'll just define them because I think people probably know what they are. And it's a factory or a workshop where manual workers are employed at very low wages for long hours and under poor conditions. I mean, I think people also know what sneakers are, but yeah, and um, tennis. Why well, I, I bring something? Okay, bring me, <laughs> bring me tennis, Aaron. Tennis is the most stylish sport. No debates. It's the most stylish sport. It really is. I love tennis. I mean, I, I think style. like football is my favorite sport. Mm-hmm. I've watched many, many, many more matches and played many more matches of football than I have tennis. But tennis is the coolest. And oh, I think goodness. it's because one, it's an individual sport, but it's an individual sport where the combatants don't finish a match covered in blood, their own blood, mm-hmm. and that of their competitor. And two, and most crucially, I think all the clothes are designed not just with the player in mind, but with their surface in mind. Mm. So we say, okay, Wimbledon, grass season in the middle of summer, we know it's going to be green. They're going to wear white. Mm -hmm. Clay season that comes before that is going to be this kind of earthy reddish orange. Mm -hmm. So we're going to put them all in a color that kind of either complements or contrasts that really nicely. And I think that's something that we don't really consider of ourselves when we are getting dressed Mm. or like, you know, making outfits. That's true. That's an interesting like inspiration. Where are you going to be wearing it? And I also think like without wanting to sound again too kind of like classist, 
there's an elitism to tennis. Oh, for right? sure. Yeah. Maybe, maybe I'm looking at a, a softer and more positive version of this. I'll call it like as, there's an aspirational aspect hmm. where there's such a wealth to it. Yeah, but also for it, sure. It's a, traditionally, it's a it's a gentleman's game, right? It's like an upper class sport that people yeah. play. So I think that's also you are maybe fashion is healthier when we are looking upwards and kind of striving upwards or maybe that's not right maybe because obviously in recent years it's been flipped where the thing is to like cosplay like a homeless person mm -hmm. like spend a lot of money to look as poor as possible that's kind of been the thing yeah. whereas before that maybe it was the opposite and also somewhere in between is norm core where we embrace looking as middle class as possible or like as just basic and boring as possible did you just come up with that or is it a thing norm -core? Norm -core? no that's a thing oh, okay yeah you can like I say it and you know exactly like the outfits it's, it's yeah. come to mind. Yeah. But sometimes it's deliberate is what I'm saying, that people mm -hmm. dress like that, which is kind of ironic. But yeah, I don't really know. That's a conversation for another day about class and fashion and whether we're looking up or down or whether that's not really the way to, to typify the conversation at all. But what we can agree on is tennis players are stylish. They really are. Next. Thrift. The careful use of money, especially avoiding waste. And on the dictionary, I thought there'd be a definition of like thrift as we use it as like a, as a verb, like to thrift. Yeah, to thrift. And you say, I'm going thrifting, da, da, da. But it's, it's not even defined as that in a dictionary. Maybe you should say scavenge. Yeah, but my favorite <laughs> part of thrift was that it says, especially avoiding waste. And I think that's a part of thrift shopping that we've kind of forgotten because when you buy something from a thrift store, it almost becomes disposable. I mean, I don't know if everyone's mindset's like this, but even for me. Yeah, I think that's just you. But it's like you can buy, like, oh, I just bought it from the thrift store. Like, I'm just going to buy this. Like, I've got a sleeping bag. And it's like maybe you're just buying it for one camping trip and then you'll redonate it or whatever. It feels more disposable oh, than like if you a, bought it at the full price. Almost like you're renting it. Kind because of. Because then you can redonate it. Yeah, that's exactly. That's how you think of it. But that's not a good way of thinking about it. Yeah, I don't think it's a good way of thinking about it. Next. Transparency. Practice of openly sharing information about how, where, and by whom a product was made and a kind of sub of this is traceability, being able to trace back each component of an item throughout the supply chain. So I'll get more into what these mean in a practical sense of like how you can be traceable and transparent. Yeah. But even the most, like the brands that come to mind to people in the sustainability sphere, when you think about, like I think it is Everlane whose motto is radical transparency. They're transparent but they omit things. And I think in the solo scene, it will not, like you won't be allowed or you'll have the moral kind of opposition to omitting because I always have thought about lying as more than just saying something that is not true. It is also intentionally omitting stuff. Yeah, of, course, of course. So with that brand, they don't talk about the working conditions. They only talk about the, the nice transparent things that they can be like, oh, this is all organic cotton. This is upcycled. They don't say this is also made in a sweatshop. Like a lot of companies will say they're transparent and traceable, but they'll only tell you about the good things. They'll just like omit the bad things. Next. Upcycling. Turning waste into reusable material, but of a better quality. And upcycling often requires a lot of creativity and craftsmanship and innovation. So often I found when upcycling was like a trend in the early 2000s, it kind of would often be making something into a worse version. And I feel like people can kind of fall into that. Like I've even seen um, fashion influencers like, oh, I have this nice jean jacket, but today I want it to be a vest and just cut off the sleeves. Yeah. And it's like now those sleeves are garbage. And it's like, yeah, cool. Like you're wearing it as a vest, but like you're just wasting it and it's not necessarily a better version of it. And it's like the most sustainable piece of your clothing in your wardrobe is the ones that you actually wear. Like it's better to actually wear them. So to an, it's really it's hard to say. Yeah, but I, I think and you need an element of skill. <laughs> I made this pair of jeans out of 50 pairs of jeans. Yeah, it's exactly. Like, so I just think you need to like, in order for something to be truly upcycled and sustainable, you need to inject something into it. Like you need to bring value. Yeah. And this is kind of like an issue with the late stage capitalism in general of like, people will add steps or will kind of complicate something and make it more expensive 
but they're not actually injecting any value, just kind of injecting complexity to mm-hmm. it. And there's a big difference there, in my opinion. Kool-Aid bags, though. Those are... The, like, I was thinking of the Kool-Aid bags turning into, like, an actual bag. And it's like, you are actually bringing... Like, you really, yeah, you have no use for it. Problem is the flies. Yeah, the flies will get in. We'll get you. Next. Upgrades. I know you have something between upcycle and upgrades. No, I don't. Unlikely. And this is going back to a quote, which is I always try and live by when I'm like imagining stuff for the solo scene, which is that we should make real life as exciting as video games. Mm-hmm. And video game characters, I'm thinking about Link in Breath of the Wild, or most of the Zelda games actually, he gets different armor and can take it to the fairy fountains, bring them some mushrooms and apples and stuff like this, and they will upgrade his armor Ooh. in various ways. So I think if we think of our clothes as somewhat <laughs> liquid pieces of art that can be upgraded over time, yeah, it will make you, one, less likely to throw something out, and two, more likely to kind of um, develop an actual affinity for your clothes. Mm. I mean, for me, this is, I have a an unfortunate tendency to downgrade inadvertently by, like, my two types of upgrades are either because I have no talent with the sewing machine, I either cut things or mm-hmm. I bleach them. You do have so that So it's like tendency. those are both basically downgrades. But you can kind of, things can, can grow with you in this sense. Yeah, I think so. It's part of, yeah, it's really close to upcycling that you want it to be yeah. an improved quality, an improved utility. And also close to custom, that I said before. Yeah. It's basically like changing it instead of buying something new. Yeah. And sometimes it could be really minor. Like I used to change my shoelaces sometimes. Yeah. And be like, this is cool. Or if you change a string in a hoodie or whatever yeah you upgrade them cool next vintage vintage is used to describe clothing jewelry etc that is not new especially when it is a good example of a style of the past so it's different than like secondhand and often i find thrift stores will be like we're all vintage but it's like this is from sheen from two years ago (laughs) and like maybe it has to actually be old for it to be vintage. Yeah. Certain people toss around different ages associated with retro, vintage, antique, etc. But like for me, vintage, it's like it has to be at least probably, I don't know, maybe you could say older than your parents. Is this vintage Ikea? Vintage. It's in the 70s, isn't it? I don't know. No, it's almost certainly not from the 70s. Okay. But it's not from anything current because it's actually good quality. Firm, even though it's yeah. plastic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, think I think maybe just because of when we are, vintage has this connotation, like maybe the best use of it is just was well made. So like mm. Sheen two years ago, no. Or even like, I don't know, Old Navy two decades ago, no. Yeah. But maybe like a good brand two decades ago, a more yeah. quality brand that is. Yes, because that was before they introduced polyester everything or something yeah, exactly. like that. Like I have that Simon, that vintage Simon's. That I would call vintage because exactly. it's like it's made of actual cotton. It's handmade in Montreal. Right. Whereas now all of the things from Simon's are made in China. Yeah. And they're made of polyester. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. But vintage, I think we overuse it a bit. Maybe we can kind of bring it back and actually make it mean, yeah, quality and old. I like that definition. That's all for me. But next. Waves. That's my last one. Cool. And I had this... I. I'm not a big slang guy, as you know. Mm. I don't really keep up. I say you eco, don't. like that's a, bit, a little bit ahead of the curve. Eek. But um, for the most part, I think I have quite a quite a boring vocabulary, <laughs> I guess you'd say. <laughs> like a like you'd find most of the words I use in a dictionary. You use lit. I do use lit sometimes. <laughs> it's lit, um, but even that I think is passe now. Yeah, I think so it I don't is. Know. But waves and like wavy. I always thought that was a funny like that's a cool word. So I think in fashion, it's not a solo scene specific concept or exclusive because, like I said, it's already used. Yeah. But just maybe the way of viewing, rather than seasons, we view it in waves. Mm. Like in cinema, we do that with the French New Wave mm. or something. Like maybe we kind of, neorealism, like that's a wave. Like maybe we waves. can kind of look at things like that. I like that. And it's much more organic than just like trends, which feel very like points yeah. on a... Timeline waves feel like they could overlap. They could exactly. come and go a little bit. And I also think we kind of do the wave thing when we say, oh, it's 90s or it's 80s. Yeah. 
But what I don't like about that is the really like, oh, that's a millennial. Like the, the mm-hmm. connotation to the generations kind of thing, I think is is just weird. Yeah. And also this doesn't quite fit in with waves, but I just wanted a history uh word in the vocabulary, like because the bodies that the clothes have been on haven't really changed that much in the last, I don't know, thousands of years. I can put on sandals and feel like I'm in the Iliad. It's so true. It's kind of like clothes as this like time travel thing mm. in a way. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like if you want to like feel like a 50s housewife, you just put on a 50s dress and you're like, now I'm going to bake bread and yeah. be a stay-at-home mom. <laughs> sure. Or you can put on sandals and say, I'm going to go fight the Trojan War. Exactly. As the men get to say. <laughs> okay. If you like the podcast, please subscribe and like and buy the zines and buy the clothes and watch us on YouTube and subscribe there and find us on Instagram and follow there and send us some contacts, send us some emails, send us some hate, send us some love. Send us your firstborn. And stay, stay solo scene. We should have something like that. Stay eco. Bye.